Hello everybody, Sonda Adelaja here. I'm back with you with my charge to Nigeria and Nigerians. And the topic of today is why Nigeria is not Singapore. Okay, why is Nigeria not Singapore? <laughs> so many motivational speakers and even government officials lately like to refer to a particular leader. And they quote him and use his examples all the time. And that leader is the former leader, or, or the, so to say, the national leader of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. Nigerians, look to, uh, Nigerians have come to uh, love using the example of Singapore as, yeah, as an example for Nigeria because they moved from third world country to a first world country in one generation. Unfortunately, these teachers and demagogues don't usually tell us how Lee Kuan Yew managed to achieve this feat. Lee Kuan Yew, like no other man, understood the importance of altering the value system of a nation before trying to make that nation a great nation. He understood that nations and peoples are not great by the virtue of their wealth, they are only great by the wealth of their virtues. So, as a matter of urgency, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore embarked on a journey to aggressively enforce a godly value system in their society. He did this by instilling in the culture of the people a strict system of penalties. So, the people who are advocating for this kind of uh, progress and miracle in Nigeria should also tell us that Nigerians must be ready if they want to be uh, Singapore, if they want to experience the miracle of Singapore and they want to move from third world to first world, we must be ready to live a life of discipline like it was instilled in Singapore and on Singaporeans. Because the kind of discipline and penalties that is for different kind of vices and you know, out of norm behaviors in Singapore, if they instill those disciplines in Nigeria, Nigerians will revolt. They will call the, especially the elite will revolt. They will call the governor, the government or the president who does that, they will call him a dictator. They will say he's, right now they are even calling Buhari dictator who has not even done anything. I think that Buhari has re refused to be, to act on disciplinary matters. Like unlike uh, Link Kuan Yew. So let me continue with Singapore. The penal, the pe penal, the penal system of Singapore is only rivaled by those of the Muslim nations of the Middle East. <laughs> Briefly, we shall have a look at some of the penalties the Singapore that exist in the Singaporean society, in the Singapore society. Incidentally, even though some of these penalties were established decades ago, they are still being adhered to, adhered to by Singaporeans today because, because of the 40 years that they were enforced by Lin Kuan Yew. So when we admire the state of Singapore, their progress, their stability, their wealth, their prosperity, and their sound value system, we should know that these things don't just fall from the sky. They must be introduced and enforced by somebody. This, therefore, must be the role of a remnant leader. If we have, and even if the leader and the political leaders will not do it in Nigeria, let the society begin to arise. Let the civil societies begin to raise their voice. Let ordinary people begin to campaign for a life and a lifestyle of discipline for a society that is living by the rule of law. Because Lee Kuan Yew was a remnant leader who understood the importance of value systems in developing a nation. Here are some of the, I'm going to give you some of the penalties and some of the punishments for civil disobedience in Singapore. You will be shocked. If we introduce these things in Nigeria, I don't know if, I think Nigerians themselves will overthrow that government. Number one, if you are caught chewing gum, chewing gum, chewing gum, you are penalized in Singapore. You can pay a fine of up to $1,000 or go to prison for one year because you are chewing gum, especially in public. If you cross the road, number two, if you cross the road in the wrong place in Singapore, you are going to be penalized because you did not act by the truth. 
you, are, you will pay the fine of $200 just because you crossed the road in the wrong place. If we do that in Nigeria, our budget will, be, <laughs> will become a rich country immediately because everybody is crossing the road in the wrong place. And if you are going to be punishing people for chewing gum to pay $1,000, we will not have def uh, budget deficit. But if you begin to find people to pay $1,000 in Nigeria, everybody in Nigeria will be in prison because most people will not be able to afford that one kind of penalty, $1,000 for chewing gum. But if, can you imagine, just tell me, what do you think will begin to happen in Nigeria if that kind of stringent uh, law is enforced in Nigeria? Okay, so, but number three, if you are found littering, throwing things, littering the place by throwing bottles, paper on the ground, you are either in prison in Singapore or you are fined $800 for throwing paper on the ground. $800. You, does Nigeria still want to become a Singapore? Do we still want to become a developed country? Do we want to? It is the value system that is lacking. Developed countries are developed on values. It is values that develop countries. If we don't first of all shape our values, if we don't first of all correct our values, we will never become a grown, a, a developed and civilized society. So it is all about value system of Nigerians. Are we ready to change our values? Are we ready to become a disciplined nation? Now, next point in, on Singapore, if you are caught spitting like that, yeah, <laughs> or defecating in public, you are heavily penalized, or in most of the cases, you are even sent to prison for it. Next point, if you are caught throwing a cigarette butt, you finish smoking and you throw the cigarette butt, you will be penalized with similar punishment as, as if you, have, you are a great offender. You will be, so what is the penalty for throwing a uh, cigarette butt somewhere? $1,000. That is if it is the first time or you are offending, if, it's, if it's, that's your first crime. But if it's not a, you are not a first time offender, it will be $5,000 for a repeated offense like that. Just throwing something on the ground. If you are caught with illegal drugs, <laughs> that one will not even talk. You are sentenced to death. If you, let me give you another one. If you are caught eating in, trans, in public place, like in the transport, for example, in, in the car, in the transport, or you are caught smoking, not where it is des designated for smoking, but outside, maybe in the box stop or on the street, <laughs> you are fined another $1,000, between $500 to $1,000. If you are caught vandalizing, like making graffiti, that's vandalizing. You are not just punished and fined, you are caned. You know? <laughs> and the way they cane you is that they ask you to remove your backside, I mean, your clothes, open your backside, and in your, on your bare skin, body, they give you 24 strokes of beating, of cane. That is just for a little offense, like, <laughs> like graffiti, like, uh, you know, vandalizing. Now, who is ready for this in Nigeria? You tell me. Is Nigeria ready for this kind of this is why we are not living good. This is why we are not living like a developed country. This is why we are not living like a civilized country. Because we are not ready to pay the price of civilization. We are not ready to pay the price of development. Come go to Europe too or America. There is law is everywhere. There are laws and you are punished for any single offense. But in Nigeria, there is no law. And Nigerian elites like it like that. When there is no law, anybody can do what they want. Let me give you another example of Singapore. If you use the public toilet, all right, I'm not talking of those who don't even use toilet, like in Nigeria, but if you go and use the public toilet and you refuse to flush it, right, to clean after yourself, you will be caned and flogged just like the other one. Another example, if you walk about unclad, undressed, or nude, even in your own house, you will be heavily penalized. <laughs> You'll be punished for it. Because you are disturbing the peace of the, of the society. If you hug in public without permission, you will be penalized. 
So who wants to now live in Singapore? Who wants to be a country like Singapore? Do we still want Nigeria to become a country like Singapore? Because we are unruly. We are indisciplined. The problem, the number one problem for our country is value system. On, and it's not just for the politicians. It's starting from the politicians to ordinary people, to school people, to university students. It is discipline until we can grace of a government or our people themselves, civil society, until we can arise and demand that there will be discipline in, and there will be the respect of, to the rule of law. There will be nothing that, like development or you know better standard of living in our country. Now, if, let me give you another example for, of Singapore. If you criticize other religions, you are going to jail. That one, no controversy. You are going to prison. Another example, if you tell a lie, for example, you are introducing a stranger and you are saying that stranger is your friend. You lied. That is considered a deception and you will go to jail for it. If, another example, if you go and you log up, in, you know you go and you see internet, open internet, and you log up into the internet connection without paying for it. That is regarded as hacking or stealing. And that attracts a fine of $5,000. If you are caught in, that's another example, if you are caught in unlawful sexual relationship, you get two years in prison. Mutiny, discharge of, dis, uh, discharge of firearm, treason, murder are punishable only by death. Robbery is punishable by caning and public sentence. And this is not a Muslim country, but they just needed to bring order to their country. And thanks to that, that country has a higher standard of living today than the United States of America and than most European countries. If you drive drunk or under influence of alcohol, alcohol that is punishable by FT fines and prison terms. <laughs> if you pirate other people's work, you are going to pay $1,000 for it. And then, but if you steal or shop to lift, <laughs> you will pay eh, from your nose, punishable by every fines. But if you, are, if, you are, if you abuse somebody on racial grounds, like racism, every penalty is waiting for you. So that is like tribalism, like saying somebody is an Igbo or Ausa, uh, Mula or Mola, something. <laughs> this is how <laughs> uh, Singapore became a rich and wealthy country. Because everywhere, and then be a disciplined country, most importantly. Are we really ready to become a developed country, to become a Singapore, to move from third world to first world country? Let's follow the example. There's a video I want us to watch where Western people are analyzing Nigeria. Why is it that we have so much material resources, wealth, and yet we are not developed? Because countries don't grow, don't become developed by wealth, by, material, by mineral resources, by raw materials. It is by value systems. So let's see this video, please. Let's talk about Nigeria and its oil. Nigeria is Africa's top oil producer, and oil is the government's biggest source of revenue. But the economy has been struggling, and poverty levels are on the rise. The poverty of those living around the source of Nigeria's wealth is bare to see. So why can't Nigerians depend on their country's oil wealth? What happens to all that money? They call Nigeria the African giant for a reason. It's home to Africa's biggest population and largest economy, powered by a growing services industry and agricultural exports like cocoa and palm oil. It has Nollywood, Africa's biggest film industry, fashion houses, a booming music business, and a very wealthy elite, including the richest man in Africa, Aliko Dangote. Nigeria also has a lot of natural resources, minerals, gold, and oil lots of oil. It's got the second largest proven reserves on the African continent and is the 12th largest producer worldwide. And yet, many Nigerians have it hard. 
World Poverty Clock says 90 million people live not just in poverty, but extreme poverty. That's 48% of the population. Compare that to 24% in Ethiopia and 16% in Kenya, and they don't even have oil. Despite Nigeria's vast oil wealth, half its population lives on less than $2 a day. Now you'd think a resource-rich country like Nigeria could rely on some of that oil wealth. The thing is, the Nigerian government does, but that's part of the problem. Nigeria's government depends on oil for as much as 75% of its revenue. So when global oil prices bottomed out in 2014, Nigeria went into recession, and it's still struggling to get out. But even when oil prices are good, Nigerian experts say not a huge slice of that revenue gets to the people. The focus should be of the money that the Nigerian government gets, how much is reinvested into the lives of the people. They're still using some of that oil revenue to pay off debts and the rest to pay salaries to the lawmakers. So things like schools, hospital, infrastructure, much needed infrastructure does not get built. Okay, so where does that revenue go? Let's follow the money and the oil. Nigerian crude is found right here under the waterways of the Niger Delta. A few Nigerian companies operate there, but the ones doing most of the exploring and extracting are international companies. Shell is one of the big ones. It provides 40% of Nigeria's oil production. But because Nigeria doesn't have the infrastructure to refine its own crude oil, these foreign companies sell it abroad. And in the end, Nigeria has to import billions of dollars worth of refined oil back in. You know, multinational actually extracts the oil. So if they think that refining the oil in, in Switzerland or refining it in, in the United States will help them lower costs, definitely that's where they will do it because the capacity to refine it isn't there in Nigeria. Now what Nigeria does have is a central body called the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. The NNPC is both an oil industry regulator and a massive commercial corporation. The corporation arm signs contracts with all those international companies and the companies pay for all the initial costs plus things like oil licenses, royalties and a tax on their profits to the NNPC. So the NNPC takes all that money and pays it into Nigeria's national treasury. But the regulator that's supposed to police that flow of money is part of the NNPC. It means that there is a huge lack of transparency, that a lot of transactions are happening under a cloak of obscurity. You cannot be both a regulator and a player. You can't be a referee and a player as well. It just doesn't make any sense. That lack of transparency has led to corruption in the oil sector. Billions of dollars in oil money have gone missing over the years. One of the most infamous cases was back in 2016. It was reported that 16 billion US dollars in oil revenue had just gone missing. And this money was supposed to be given from NNPC and sent to the national treasury. But the money was not sent over. So every few years in Nigerian headlines, you see things like 16 billion missing, 30 billion missing. There's another type of missing oil money, and that's taxes. As we mentioned earlier, international oil companies are supposed to pay taxes on their oil profits to the NNPC. But companies are accused of reporting lower profits in order to pay fewer taxes. So a company can sell Nigerian oil at a lower price to its own subsidiary in a tax haven, and then sell that oil to other buyers at full price. They can inflate the costs of their Nigerian operations or underreport the volume of oil they produce to begin with. So public oil money gets lost in a swamp of tax havens and murky accounting. And then there's theft. Yes, straight up stealing. Tucked in the forest, we find these men cooking oil. There are hundreds of illegal refineries in the Niger Delta, where criminal gangs like the Delta Avengers tap into pipelines. In early 2019, 22 million barrels of oil were stolen and sold on the black market. The barges then take it to larger tankers in the Atlantic Ocean, and from there to buyers in West Africa, Europe, Latin America, and as far as Asia. There's even a language in Nigeria that conveys and captures the sentiment that the oil is here to steal. For example, you'll hear a phrase in Nigeria called the national cake, and that just means the oil mine. You still want to become a Singapore? If we want to become a Singapore, then what happens is we need to enforce penalties. We need to enforce penalties, but we're not. We like it the way it is. We like the country to be you know, ruled, I mean, to be unruly, to be lawless, to just be chaotic. 
And that is why everything is the way it is. Why Nigeria is not Singapore? Why are we not developed? Why are we underdeveloped? No rules. Listen closely. What these people are trying to say and what Singaporeans and all developed countries have understood is that nations don't become great by the virtue of their wealth. You see all the wealth about Nigeria they are talking about? Nations don't become great by the virtue of their wealth. They only become great by the wealth of their virtues. When we are wealthy in virtues, then we become wealthy nation. But right now, we, we are wealthy in raw materials, mineral resources, but we are poor in virtues, that's why we are a poor country. For the love of God, church and nation, peace.